proud of these efforts, but we're not naive. This won't be enough to deal with what's coming. That's why we're, we're committed to continuing to support CLAD programs even after the pandemic has passed. The county says there's still no telling just how many evictions and foreclosures could be filed as moratoriums lift, but experts predict an influx. Funding for the program is seeded with a million dollars from the CARES Act. A few thousand CPS high school students got a pretty big surprise today. You know, I wanted to hop in here uh, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I just wanted to say how proud I am of all of you for continuing your efforts, your studies, your focus, your commitment to your education in the midst of, let's face it, a, a, a pretty tough situation. Former President Barack Obama popped into a virtual assembly to let the students know they'd all be receiving digital copies of his new memoir, A Promised Land. He also announced plans to circle back with those students for a virtual follow-up conversation about the book. You can read more about today's discussion on our website. The growing number of coronavirus cases and those who need to be hospitalized because of it has some area hospitals on edge. They're watching bed space, availability of personal protective equipment, and one another's mental health. Chicago Tonight's Amanda Venicky is reporting live from the Illinois Medical District, two miles west of the Loop, which is anchored by four major hospitals, Rush, Stroger, University of Illinois, and the Jesse Brown VA Hospital. Amanda Venicky joins us now, Amanda. Yes, Brandis, the medical district is a cluster of medical centers, biotech companies and hospitals like Stroger. Dr. Michael Hoffman is the lead physician for Cook County Health's COVID units, and he says that amid scenes of crowded airports, folks heading home for the holidays, well, he isn't mincing words. If we don't do our part and stay within our own household for Thanksgiving, some of us may be planning funerals for the December holidays. Yeah. Please make no mistake that people will die because of Thanksgiving gatherings. Hoffman says he usually flies to either of the coasts to be with his family for Thanksgiving and his siblings are disappointed because he's usually the one who's cooking the feast, but not this year. Thursday, he'll be working instead. You can be asymptomatic or presymptomatic and still transmit COVID to other people. And when you're in that what we consider prolonged close contact. I mean, really, that's 15 minutes in close proximity to somebody without wearing masks. That's not a long time. And you'd imagine during holiday meals and, and things of that nature, the risk is really, really high. Worried that people are not going to heed these warnings. Cook County Health called in the big guns or the little guys, depending on how you look at it, like seven year olds Mason and Mia, whose moms are a respiratory therapist and an ER nurse, respectively. My team helps patients with COVID bleed. They work really hard because they care about their patients. I know we all want to celebrate the holidays, but please stay home. My holiday wishes for everyone to stay at home and so everyone doesn't get the COVID. Clinical nurse Nimi Tom cares exclusively for coronavirus patients. She says it can be a very isolating experience for them. She encourages them to use the phone by their hospital bedside to call their loved ones. We just try to check on them because this kind of patients can drop down to any time because, you know, sometimes they'll come with the mild symptoms and within no time, the situations can be changed. So we need to uh, closely monitor them. The experience has been stressful for her too, or at least it was early on. Tom is nine months pregnant. She's due to give birth to a baby girl in January. It was kind of very difficult, you know, like everyone, even I was nervous too. Uh, and and I was pregnant too, uh, but it's my duty, you know, it's my father or my brother, you know, my family. It's my responsibility to take care of them. Someone has to be there to take care of them, right? So they are so grateful, you know, so thankful to us. You know, some days they will bless my baby, so I know that my baby is going to be, you know, uh, so healthy, you know. That's why I'm not scared at all now. 
The emotional toll on medical staff is a chief concern for Rush University's acting chair of psychiatry and behavioral services. Dr. Robert Schulman is also concerned about the short and the long term ramifications of all of the COVID forced isolation that so many of us are experiencing. Some of that impact isn't yet quantified. It's hard to measure, but he's eyeing things like a spike in ER visits related to alcohol abuse and an increased demand for psychiatry services. What he wonders will the impact be on all of us, especially children, on hiding smiles behind our masks? Look, you have to work hard at maintaining a connection to diminish your isolation. Granted, it's going to be virtual, right? But you're going to have to do something. You're going to have to reach out to people. You want to reach out to your loved ones. If you're worried about anyone, reach out. I know you can't see your parent at the assisted living, but by golly, you know, it's going to take extra effort, but they need you to be in touch, to be in contact. Rush has transformed a main lobby so that it's now an intake center for patients with COVID like symptoms. It's one of the ways that Rush is adapting so that a bed shortage hopefully does not become an issue. Rush will also soon launch a multi specialty clinic to help hospitalize COVID patients once they're released as they combat possible neurological, circulatory, and cardiac issues. Now, hospitals within the medical district will, in the next few days, also resume bi weekly conference calls. District Director Suzette McKinney says they had collaborated like this early on in the pandemic to talk about the ability to deal with the COVID surge and the potential to share resources. The calls were paused, but now they're going to restart. We want to ensure that the hospitals and the staff there are reminded that those resources and those partnerships are in place. There's nothing that's extremely urgent at this point. McKinney is also the lead for the state of Illinois on alternate care facilities like McCormick Place when it was set up as a backstop for an overflow of coronavirus patients. She says she realizes that these have been criticized by some as unnecessary and a waste of money. But my perspective on the issue is preparedness is a journey. It's not a destination. And so for our system here in Illinois, I think it's much more reassuring to the residents of our state that we have a capability and not need it rather than needing a capability and not have it. Illinois is currently maintaining the shuttered Metro South Hospital in the event that it needs to be activated. Prandes, back to you. Amanda, thank you. And now we go to Paris with a look at the proposed city budget. Paris. Brandis, Chicago Mayor Lori Lightfoot's proposed 2021 budget goes before City Council tomorrow. That means aldermen will vote yes or no to raise property taxes by $94 million, along with other budget items like a three cent hike in the gas tax and new speed camera tickets for cars going six miles per hour over the limit, among some other measures. The mayor hopes that this will all be part of a solution to fill the city's $1.2 billion dollar budget deficit and joining us with more are alderman brian hopkins who represents the second ward which includes parts of the near north side alderman jason irvin chair of the city council's black caucus who represents the 28th ward on the west side alderman rosana rodriguez sanchez who represents the 33rd ward on chicago's northwest side and alderman andre vasquez of the 40th ward on the north side good to see all of you again uh, the way i look at it here it looks like we've got two yes votes two no votes, at least the way things went in committee. Alderman Hopkins, you voted no in committee on that property tax hike. So how do you believe the city should make up some of that money without hiking property taxes? Yeah, that's a great question, Paris. And when you're facing unprecedented structural deficits like this, I think it's incumbent on all of us who've expressed opposition to some of the revenue pieces to have alternatives. And I have one. Uh, the revenue suggestion that I proposed um, would be a financing of future litigation. Uh, we're in line to receive a substantial uh, settlement uh, similar to what we did a few years ago with the tobacco litigation, only this time it's not the tobacco companies, it's the pharmaceutical companies. Uh, we've been going after them for the uh, opioid crisis. How much money do you expect that'll be? Uh, minimum 50 million, possibly more, uh, depending on what uh, financier you talk to, but enough to get us out from at least half of the required property tax increase, um, potentially more than that. I think it could be as much as 70 million. And I've been in conversation with the law department uh, and they're pursuing the idea. Unfortunately, they haven't been able to move quick enough um, to put it on the table right now. 
Um, but that is one more idea that's out there as a potential revenue source right. that doesn't require property tax increase. Alderman Irvin, uh, you are supportive, and it looks like the, the Black Caucus, the majority of it, uh, which you lead, will be supportive. Do you have concerns about the property tax hike and some of these other fee and fine hikes? Anytime you uh, have uh, increased any fees or, or taxes, of course, there's always concern. But I also think that we have to think about the alternative, which are cuts in services that our uh, citizens so desperately need and rely upon. Uh, one of the challenges I, I think that Alderman Hopkins brings is that, again, these are additional one-time revenue sources that long-term do not give us the structural fixes uh, that we need for our city and our citizens to be successful. Alderman Rodriguez Sanchez, you know, uh, there, there were a number of proposals put forth by the more progressive aldermen on uh, new uh, sources of tax income from, from the wealthy. Are you disappointed that a lot of those aren't included in this package? Yeah, of course. Of course, I'm disappointed. And I, I feel like it is about time that we start thinking about how to make sure that our ideas um, are considered in the council, that we have a chance to discuss those ideas, that things that we introduce are not directly sent to rules so that there can actually be debate around these ideas because that is what transparent and good government should be about. You know, Alderman Vasquez, a lot of your colleagues in, in sort of the Democratic Socialist Caucus are not for this budget. You are for this budget. How come? Yeah, um, um, one, I'll say I, I don't believe it is a good budget, and I, I'm not, I don't say that uh, to undermine a lot of the work that was done to try to craft it, um, but I think it was a necessary budget. I think when we're looking at the fact that the federal government wasn't, under Trump, wasn't funding the city, that the fair tax didn't pass and the General Assembly doesn't even meet for the veto session, that the ultimate problem got laid at the desk of the municipal government. And so we had a lot of difficult choices to make, and I'm happy or at least I, I feel comforted by the fact that the Black, Latino, and Progressive Caucuses formed a coalition for the first time in Chicago history to actually extract wins from the budget. So um, a lot of the negotiations were tough, um, but I think at the end, it was something that needed to happen for this year, and hopefully we're not back having the same conversation a year from now. And sometimes the final solution is something that everybody is equally unhappy with, and, and that's what they term success. You know, some of your colleagues were saying, why not wait to the Biden administration to get some more federal funding possibly? Here's Alderman Ed Burke on that last week. It's really important for us to base this budget on what we know at this point. And what we know at this point is that the revenue forecasts are not looking great in large part because we're in the second wave. We don't know that we have federal funding. I'm sorry, that was the, the city's uh, uh, chief financial officer answering uh, Alderman Burke's question about that. Uh, Alderman Hopkins, do you expect there will be more federal bailout money under a Biden administration? I fully expect there will. And uh, some of the uh, voices that we're hearing on the transition committee right now have sort of uh, suggested that. So they're sending out a message to the urban cities and urban counties across the country, help is on the way. I don't think it's gonna be here fast enough uh, to make some budgetary decisions now. That's the best case scenario. I think we have to go forward with the assumption that there won't be federal assistance in fiscal year 2021. And then if it comes in you know, July, August, September, plugging that into the existing need will actually be a good problem to have. And I think we can do it. And there's also a $1.4 billion borrowing package for infrastructure funding. Alderman Irvin, is it responsible to add that kind of debt to, to the city's mountains of debt that it already faces? I think it is responsible. Uh, number one, it's going to help uh, sustain and create jobs. And I think that's key in a situation like this. Similarly to what the federal government has done, it is borrowed money to pump out to keep the economies moving and going. So I, I do believe that at a time such as this, uh, when our infrastructure is in such shambles, I hope that something comes from uh, Washington that would help us address some of the infrastructure issues that many cities such as ours have with aging uh, water pipes, aging uh, electrical infrastructure, things that would be helpful to uh, bring our cities forward into the 21st century. So I believe that this type of investment at this point is proper. Alderman Vasquez is also part of this budget we mentioned at the top, uh, authorizing speed cameras to collect tickets uh, for car vehicles going six to 10 miles per hour over the speed limit, some new parking meters. Is the mayor here going back on, on her promise of not nickel and diming people to death with these regressive fees and fines? Um, I, I think we'll leave that to the voters to decide ultimately, but I think clearly 
anything that, that is of that sort is going to affect uh, middle and working class families. Um, the challenge is when you've got the restaurant industry, the hotel industry, public transportation, all these other things that are uh, revenue generating things that typically would have been funding government completely decimated by, by the pandemic. Um, and we had to look at whatever was possible. And so uh, it's not about being in support of those measures, but recognizing that they were needed to be done. All right, we're going to pick up on uh, some more of these topics in just a bit. Uh, we'll be joined by the Alderman to discuss more about Chicago's budget and the COVID-19 pandemic. But for now, my thanks to Alderman Hopkins, Irvin, Rodriguez Sanchez, and Vasquez. And now, Brandis, we toss it back to you. Paris, thank you. Over the last few weeks, there's been lots of buzz of COVID-19 vaccines. And just today, AstraZeneca announced its vaccine is on average 70% effective. But another promising vaccine from Moderna is said to be 94.5% effective against the coronavirus. Trials for that one took place right here at University of Chicago Medicine. Joining us to talk about that is Dr. Kathleen Mullane, Director of Clinical Trials for Infectious Diseases at UChicago Medicine. Welcome back, Dr. Mullane. We had you here just a couple of weeks ago. Thank you. <laughs> so a third major drug maker has announced uh, it's an effective vaccine today, AstraZeneca. It is said to be relatively cheap and easier to store um, because the others require ultra cold temperatures. What can you tell us about the differences between these vaccines? Well, the vaccine that requires the ultra cold is the Pfizer vaccine and it needs to be held at um, minus 70 centigrade which makes it a little bit difficult to be able to mobilize so it needs to be sent to areas that are capable of uh, storing it uh, who have those refrigerated devices already and certainly Pfizer is aware of that and is working hard to make sure that the vaccine can be mobilized. Moderna actually can be kept in uh, regular refrigerator temperatures and even at room temperature for a prolonged period of time. And so it's not such an issue with that. Um, the new AstraZeneca vaccine can be stored at room temperature as well. And so it does make it easier for uh, mobilizing the vaccine to places where there is um, no refrigeration available. And why is it important to have, you know, several different kind or several different vaccines uh, that are effective available when launching sort of this global uh, vaccination effort? Um, primarily because there's just no way to have capacity to make enough vaccine for everyone unless we have multiple venues that are producing it for us. Um, when we look at Pfizer, there's 50 million doses towards the end of the year. That means 25 million people will be vaccinated since it requires two doses. Moderna, again, 30 to 50 million doses. Again, that's only half of those patients because it's a two dose series. So we need all these vaccines and we still need people to step up and volunteer for these trials so that the vaccines can get to the rest of the population. Now, University of Chicago, you all are also enrolling volunteers to, uh, for the phase three test of uh, Johnson & Johnson vaccine in the ensemble trial. What can you tell us about that one? So it's a little bit different than the messenger RNA vaccines that um, the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine are. And it's different from AstraZeneca, which is a chimpanzee-based um, adenovirus. Um, the Johnson & Johnson um, platform is an adenovirus 26, which has been used in multiple vaccines in the past. Over 100,000 people have received it already in different venues, and it's available in Europe as a Ebola vaccine. So it's a non-replicative uh, virus that carries the spike protein to our immune system to introduce the spike protein. So um, as the messenger RNAs produce um, uh, antibodies against that spike protein, so does um, the AstraZeneca vaccine, and so does um, the, Jans the Janssen uh, vaccine. Okay, so for the Moderna drug trials, uh, originally University of Chicago, along with University of Illinois Chicago, um, set to recruit 500 volunteers, but you came in just a little bit under that. What are some of the challenges with recruiting volunteers for these vaccine trials? Well, part of the challenges were that we were um, very late in getting our start. Other sites were open before ours. And so we had a very limited period of time to um, enroll. And many of these studies are competitive enrollment. And so 
the faster a site gets set up, the faster their um, enrollment can be in. Um, there's no cap on the enrollment. Um, and so it's, it's hard to, to catch up once we get going. Um, certainly with the Johnson & Johnson, we're um, open and ready to go. And so hopefully we'll be able to enroll quite a few more people. Um, the biggest worries we always have are making sure that all ethnicities are represented in the trials. And we want to make sure that people realize that we work very hard to keep our patients safe. And we try to educate people as much as possible. And we want them to ask questions so that they feel comfortable being part of the trials. And you mentioned ethnicities. You know, you did meet your goal of recruiting that diverse crowd with a third of participants being black, a third Latino, and a third Asian um, for part of the study. What is the importance of getting the representation of, of different races and ethnicities in these trials? And we, we thank our population here in Chicago for being so wonderful in stepping up and volunteering. The reason that it's important is we know with some drugs that there's differences in metabolism. And so we wanna make sure that um, the, the product is safe for all ethnicities. As well, um, we know that the Hispanic population and the African-American population were unfortunately overrepresented in these trials or in the COVID epidemic. And so we wanted to make sure that they were represented in the trials to show that the vaccine would work in those populations and hopefully to decrease the fear that um, the underserved populations in our city have about the healthcare system not being adequate, not being fair to all people. Okay, and I know everybody's holding out hope that of all these vaccines, we can all get one soon, or some of us are anyway. Uh, our really thanks to <laughs> Dr. Kathleen Mullane at uh, University of Chicago Medicine. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. And up next, we dig into some of the top stories reverberating in the world of science. Stay with us. Coverage of science and technology on Chicago Tonight is made possible in part by Joel M. Friedman, president of the Alvin H. Baum Family Fund. Getting an early warning of future COVID outbreaks by examining sewage, 3D printed hearts that could one day be used to train surgeons, and an ultra-fast camera that can take 10 billion pictures in the blink of an eye fast enough to capture the movement of light itself. Joining us now to help us understand some of these latest science stories making headlines is Robbie Amaya's Vice President of Education and Guest Experiences at the Museum of Science and Industry. Robbie Amaya, good to see you. Good to see you, Paris. Thanks for having me. Okay, well, thanks for being here. So first at UIC, a team of scientists is trying to put together uh, this system that will analyze sewage to help detect future COVID outbreaks. Explain the science behind this. Yeah, so there has been evidence for some time that the RNA from the novel coronavirus, which is the genetic material, the RNA, um, can be detected in stool samples even before symptoms arise in a, in a patient who has the coronavirus. Um, and so analyzing um, wastewater or sewage provides an opportunity to look for the RNA from the virus and start to understand on a geographic level, maybe in a neighborhood, in a community, on a university campus, um, the potential spikes in cases and perhaps even get ahead of an outbreak. And as I understand, there's some places that are doing this. How's it working? Uh, there are. So um, at last time I checked, there were more than 40 countries around the world that have some kind of sewage testing. Uh, not all of them are sharing all of their data, but I think it's interesting to note that there have been other circumstances where sewage testing for um, viruses has been really impactful in helping to predict an outbreak and help medical professionals stage intervention. So um, there was a polio virus outbreak several years ago in Israel where sewage was part of the solution. Um, it's also been used to detect things like opioids in a particular community. So there's great potential for this to be useful in Chicago. When do you think a system might be up and running to detect uh, uh, the RNA in sewage, as you said, and would it just be around the university or different parts of the city? My understanding is that this is broad, that this is really looking to, to test around Chicago, and I'm not sure around the timing, but I think what's really important is that this is a collaborative project. Um, a lot of different players involved, as, as you would imagine, being really important, and it certainly won't replace things like individual testing, um, and that's not the goal, but in fact, the, the intent is maybe we can start to understand potential outbreaks or increases in cases even before the individual, individual testing will tell us, because um, again, it's showing up in stool samples and in waste a bit earlier than perhaps symptoms and in individual testing is. 
All right, that's fascinating line of inquiry here. Let's move on to the next story. An ultra-fast camera making 3D movies uh, at about 100 billion frames a second. So for comparison, the average <laughs> iPhone does 60 frames a second. How is it possible to do so many frames in such a short time? I find it hard to even get my mind around it. Um, I'm not even sure that I have, but it is a fascinating technology that was developed um, a few years ago um, from uh, Caltech and other researchers that have developed a way to have two cameras um, that are capturing observations and sending all that data to a computer that combines them. And so it is super, super fast. Um, and this particular new development um, created, the upper, created the ability for this camera to take 3D videos. So um, in addition to being able to take that many frames per second, they can actually, this camera can turn it into actual three-dimensional video. And, and as I understand, I mean, because it's so many frames per second, you can actually see light move, the right. movement of light. So what's like the usefulness of something like this? Where could this be applied? Yeah, so this is completely not for people like us who are just taking pictures of every day or videos of our, our neighbors or, or the outdoors. This is really an opportunity to um, allow researchers to look at things um, that happen transiently, right? So processes and reactions and chemistry and physics and biology that happen in, you know, far faster than a second. This kind of technology could allow researchers to see it um, in real time, but also to better understand what's going on um, in ways that we've never been able to see before. It's amazing technology. All right, some more amazing technology, a 3D printed heart. Uh, researchers at Carnegie Mellon University have printed a 3D heart, not a real heart, but one that surgeons can practice on. Tell me why this is such a breakthrough. Yeah, so this is a breakthrough in, in part because previous 3D printing of organs like hearts um, have often been done with more traditional materials. It can be hard, it's not very realistic, it certainly doesn't feel like human tissue. Um, and so this particular development was really, is really important because it combines both um, a softer material. Um, this one is, is called um, alginate. It, it comes from seaweed and it's relatively inexpensive. Um, and the process that they use for 3D printing is a little different from the kind of 3D printing you or I might be used to where um, the machine will deposit material in kind of the air. This new technology creates this um, 3D print in a gelatin bath. So mm. think kind of soft, gushy jello. That's the environment. And that allows for open spaces in the design to not collapse on themselves, but to stay open um, the way that we might think the chambers or the blood vessels of a heart would need to be. Great advance for surgery and for medicine. All right, before we go, uh, Robbie, I want to show some footage of shed aquarium penguins running around Soldier Field. You know, <laughs> they don't have any visitors at the shed, so they got to stay active and, and keep from going crazy. Uh, so my question to you is how, how are museums, you know, in this shutdown, how are they staying viable? How are, how are they doing? I think, yeah, we join our colleagues at the Shed and all the other museums um, in the city and in the state in um, being disappointed that we're closed down, but we are all very much wanting to do everything that we can on our part to keep Chicago and safe, our staff, our guests. Um, and so our, while the buildings are closed, we are all uh, doing really fantastic work online to engage our guests visual, uh, virtually, excuse me, um, and online. So at uh, the Museum of Science and Industry, we have a science at home page with fun activities for families. We have a brand new learning resources hub that has materials for educators and learners. Um, and one of our most popular exhibits every year, Christmas Around the World and Holidays of Light, um, we will have ways to bring that to home and to people's screens. So we're very excited to stay connected with our guests um, as we all go through this time together and are really looking forward to when we can open again. And it looks like those penguins were having a really good time on the field at Soldier Field. <laughs> so our best to you at the Museum of Science and Industry and all the cultural institutions here. And our thanks to Robbie Amayas for being here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Paris. And you can find more details on these stories discussed today, plus a slew of others on our website. That's WTTW.com slash news. And now, Brandis, we go back to you. Those penguins are pretty cute. Thank you, Paris. <laughs> Still to come on Chicago Tonight. Popular meal kit HelloFresh expands its reach in Chicago. That and more business headlines from Cranes. We check back in with four Chicago aldermen and get their thoughts about COVID-19, Mayor Lightfoot, and more. As COVID cases rise, some sh Chicago Catholic schools could return to all remote learning. And Ernest Hemingway, action hero? A book explores the author's unexpected life in comics. But first, some more of today's top stories. State health officials say they are concerned about increased virus spread after the Thanksgiving holiday. 
Illinois Department of Public Health Director Dr. Ngazi Azike says it's not too late to avoid super spreader events. People can still change their plans and change the outcome. We don't have to have super spreader events at homes throughout throughout our state and throughout the country and then bring it back. Please reconsider your plans and see if we can be part of the solution to decrease infections instead of part of the plan to increase them. And Governor Pritzker and Dr. Azike held a virtual press conference today. The governor saying that as he's recommending the rest of the state work remotely when possible, he's asked the same of his staff. Next summer, the city of Chicago will recognize Juneteenth not as a holiday, but as a day of observance. The city first recognized Juneteenth this summer amid protests after the George Floyd killing. Today, the city council agreed to recognize June 19th every year and to reflect on the suffering endured by early African Americans. June 19th, 1865 was the day formerly enslaved black people in Galveston, Texas, learned of the Emancipation Proclamation more than two years earlier. Some aldermen had been pushing for a paid holiday for city employees, but that would have cost the city $100 million at a time when the city faces a massive budget gap, as Paris has been discussing with aldermen. There's more of this story on our website. And now back to Paris with some of today's top business headlines. Paris. The controversial Foxconn plant that President Trump once called the eighth wonder of the world gets a new customer. A bankrupt nonprofit chips away at its debt worries after selling a portion of its Chicago apartments. And the popular meal kit HelloFresh expands into the Chicago area. Here to go behind the headlines is Crane Chicago business reporter Danny Ecker. Danny, always good to see you. So starting with that Foxconn story, billions of dollars in tax breaks thrown to it. This is the plant right over the border in Wisconsin, by the way. The jobs that were promised never really materialized, but now there's a new tenant. So tell us about that. Yeah, so originally, if you remember, this was supposed to be a factory for LCD screens for TVs and have as many as 13,000 jobs. Um, you know, Foxconn, they had, they kind of scrapped that idea almost two years ago now. And then this year they were making masks and ventilators. And now today, Bloomberg reported that uh, Google is their, uh, is their new taker. Um, struck a deal with Google to uh, make components for Google servers. Uh, we don't really know the scale or the number of jobs associated with it yet, but uh, certainly it's promising for a 20 million square foot site that, you know, has kind of had some false starts, as you mentioned, since uh, since the beginning. And President Trump pointed to this as a, a huge win for American manufacturing. It's just maybe a little bit different in terms of what they're making there. Yeah, it's been a disappointment up until this point. All right, the next story here, the housing uh, nonprofit called uh, Better Housing Foundation, uh, it struggled and a part of it is now being sold for $9 million. Uh, who's the buyer and what does that mean for this nonprofit? Right, so the backstory here, the Better Housing Foundation, it's an Ohio-based nonprofit that bought a bunch of low-income apartment buildings, mostly on the south side of Chicago and in some of the suburbs a few years ago. Uh, but they came under fire for having a bunch of code violations and mismanagement. Um, it had borrowed $170 million through the Illinois Finance Authority to fund that acquisition spree. And their thesis was that they actually would have a tax exemption and that didn't pan out. They lost that status. So uh, this is actually, uh, this year they had four of those portfolios of apartment buildings put into bankruptcy court and it's been selling them off to pay back bondholders, which have been suffering big losses. Um, and so it's an opportunity for buyers. And that's the, that's the news today was that uh, we had a California based firm that bought one of the portfolios and plans to renovate it. And uh, there's still one more uh, portfolio that uh, is owned by the, the housing foundation that um, is likely to hit bankruptcy court next month. All right, we'll see what that means for some affordable housing in the city. All right, final story, uh, the meal kit company HelloFresh expanding to the Chicago area. Tell us about that. Yeah, so there's a company uh, in Batavia called Factor 75. They do uh, fully prepared meal kits and HelloFresh is acquiring them for $277 million. Um, this gives uh, HelloFresh uh, its first Chicago office. They've had some production and fulfillment um, locations in the suburbs here. Um, and it's kind of interesting just because we've had uh, now a run of a few different um, Chicago area food companies that have been big acquisition targets. Um, you had RX Bar back in 2017 that was acquired by Kellogg um, and Home, Home Chef, which was acquired by Kroger in 2018. And, you know, this just sort of, it's another, it's part of this tech chapter in Chicago's long history of being a, a center for food. So some smaller food companies getting gobbled up. All right, Danny, thank you very much. 
All right, Paris, thanks. And early in the program, we discussed Mayor Lori Lightfoot's proposed city budget. Now our guests, Alderman Brian Hopkins, Jason Irvin, Rosana Rodriguez-Sanchez, and Andre Vasquez join us uh, once again. Alderwoman uh, Rodriguez-Sanchez, well, first, I want to play a clip uh, um, from Mayor Lightfoot because she talked about some of the, the harsh uh, dealings with Alderman and promised to, to sort of temper uh, some of those relationships. Let's take a look. I need to push myself harder to work with people with whom I do not agree and who do not agree with me. Uh, Alderman Rodriguez Sanchez, uh, has she softened her approach uh, with Alderman that she's been combative with in the past? Well, unfortunately, that hasn't been my experience um, at this point, and I, I have seen how um, tumultuous this process has been, particularly because of uh, a lack of collaboration, um, which which I think really needs to improve in order for us to be able to legislate for this city. In, in Alderman Irvin, there were reports uh, where she said uh, to the Black Caucus, quote, don't bother coming to me for stuff for your ward if you don't support me on this budget. Is that the kind of thing that persuaded people to vote yes? No, I, I don't believe that was what persuaded people to vote yes. I mean, at the time, the group of people that she was speaking with told were not in support of the budget. Again, there had been movement from the position she was in previously to uh, where we are today. Um, and again, we, we expect that, you know, in any case, and this just didn't happen under Mayor Lightfoot. This was something that happened under previous mayors where you just knew that if you didn't support major budget initiatives, that it was going to be very difficult to get uh, any, any perks or anything additional outside of very basic things uh, out of the administration. So this is not anything, in my opinion, that is new. Uh, this is something that we have to, you know, work through uh, as a as a unit and, and get things done. And so um, that that's something that specifically may have been said. But again, there's nothing that hasn't been said before. Uh, Alderman Vasquez, uh, you know, this budget passed two committees. Usually, that means uh, very likely to pass full city council. Would you predict it has the votes to pass tomorrow? Uh, I would imagine that it does. I think I think it, it took a lot of negotiation. Uh, I'd say as far as the pushing the mayor to be more open, it was probably mutual pushing that had to occur for some of the conversations, but I think there are enough votes for it to be successful tomorrow. All right, um, Alderman Hopkins, let's move on to some COVID stuff. You know, small businesses are really, really hurting right now. One in your award, the hideout, the music venue that's really been fighting to stay alive because there's no live music. Um, is there any, are there any more tools in the city toolbox to help out small business owners? There are, and uh, previously your question about what we could expect from the federal government, uh, we've been receiving some very encouraging signs uh, that federal relief for the small businesses uh, will be forthcoming much sooner than we're going to see any general type of funding. Um, we think we'll be getting that in the first quarter, and that'll be targeted at businesses like the hideout um, and others, you know, bars and small restaurants, mom and pop operations that are just hanging on um, by the thinnest of threads. Um, they need relief and they need it now. Um, and we think we'll be able to have some very good news for them in the coming months. And obviously that's not the only concern. Uh, health is a huge concern. Uh, Alderman Rodriguez Sanchez, do you believe that the stay at home advisory here goes far enough to protect uh, people's health and exposure to COVID-19 as opposed to a full on stay at home order? I, I, I think that we are in big trouble right now. I think that we should be using um, the, the most strict possible measures uh, but also supporting people so that they're able to stay home because i mean you can tell people to stay home but if they have to go to work if they have to do things in order to be able to ensure their well-being it is really hard for people to be able to stay home so yes definitely i think that a lot more needs to 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 be done in order for people to be able to preserve their health uh, uh, alderman vasquez uh, cps says they're going to have k through eight uh, fully returned to school by february 1st I is it right to have uh, kids in school, teachers in school, especially when you see Catholic schools starting to go remote again. No, I, I, I don't think the school should open. I don't think it should be anywhere near a discussion. I think when we're walking into a cold winter during COVID, something we haven't experienced, and we know that kids can be asymptomatic, that a lot of the people that are in the schools are essential workers, our communities, uh, black and brown folks who are getting the most cases and the most fatalities due to COVID, I think it's irresponsible to even consider that as a date and should it start going in that direction, we'll be in the streets with the teachers. All right, Alderman uh, Irvin, we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that uh, amid all this, uh, homicides in Chicago are poised to finish above 700 uh, uh, again. Uh, 
Um, is this an anomaly this year? Do you have confidence in, in, in the Chicago police superintendent? Uh, what's your reflection on these horrible numbers? I mean, I think these numbers are a function really of, of what happened this year. Uh, we had been trending in a better direction. Uh, I don't believe that this is uh, something to lay totally at the feet of the police superintendent. Um, I think as we talked about in this budget, we need to advocate more for violence prevention resources to help those uh, young men and women who have been victims or prone to be victims of violence to help change their lives, uh, give them the necessary tools they need to be successful. And that's why we fought so hard to get additional funding for, for violence prevention in this budget. And let's think about this. Uh, violence prevention went about three, four years ago from something under a million dollars, now uh, at over $30 million. Because again, this is something that our communities have been asking for. This is something our communities need. And again, we want to help prevent deaths of young men to give them a better opportunity and give them a new path. And Alderman Rodriguez Sanchez, part of this is funding uh, money for first responders, mental health first responders to take some of these calls. Uh, you've said it doesn't go far enough, but is this a solid first step in this budget to start that project? It's take the call. Um, I think the idea that we are finally going to admit that having non-law enforcement uh, crisis response is very important to our city is, is a step in the right direction. I think that is very insufficient what is being included in this budget, and I don't think that sets up any sort of pilot for success. Um, so we're going to have to continue to fight for that in the coming budgets. All right, we're going to have to leave it there. Our thanks again to Alderman Brian Hopkins, Jason Irvin, Rosana Rodriguez-Sanchez, and Andre Vasquez. Thank you. And up next, Chicago Catholic Schools, as we said, announced the option to go all remote. Latinos, who make up one-third of the population, continue to power the city that works. These are the people that are working three jobs, knowing that COVID is out there. Those are the people that need the help, and we should help them. While some Chicago public school students are set to head back to the classroom in January, some Catholic school students could be switching to remote learning. The Archdiocese of Chicago just announced schools will have the option to transition to remote learning after Thanksgiving but they say it's not yet clear how many schools will choose to do that. Joining us with more is Justin Lombardo, Chief Human Resources Officer for the Archdiocese of Chicago. Justin, so yesterday the Archdiocese said that in a survey, 80% of schools want to continue with in-person learning, 20% wanted to go all remote, but there have been almost no known cases of coronavirus spread in schools. Why did you want to give schools this option? Well, and, uh, we wanted uh, schools to have the option so that we would understand the, the local situation that, that they're in. We, of course, look at certain criteria. And Brandis, I just wanted to clarify, when we talk about moving remote, it's not a permanent move to remote. It's simply an earlier pivot for remote learning, which we've already said will happen through January 15th. After that date, we're fully expected to be 100% back in person. But the, uh, the reason why we looked at it now was we were looking at um, the issues of the, the current trajectory of the pandemic, particularly during uh, the uh, holiday season. We were looking at what our parents are saying to us, what questions they're asking. We're also looking at, at operational issues, particularly the, the stress and the extra workload on teachers to manage a dual mode of teaching because many of them uh, uh, teach both remotely and also have to take care of the in classroom. So given all those factors, we thought let's look and ask a little bit more about where the schools are feeling they are at to manage through the Christmas break. Okay, and thank you for that point of clarification, Justin, um, because you've already announced that the first two weeks of 2021 will be all remote, all remote to create that sort of uh, quarantine period in case people should travel around Christmas. So exactly. that plan is still in effect. Um, remind yes, exactly. us. Okay, great. Remind us what uh, prevention measures you have in place for in-person learning. Well, we, we follow most of the pre prevention measures that have been proven effective um, in schools so far. We mask for the entire day. The children are placed in cohorts and they stay with that same group of students for the entire learning day 
in, and they are separated from all other students through lunch, recreation times, and all that. So they're together as a cohort every day, the same group of kids. We manage to social distancing. We encourage, obviously, and keep um, hand sanitizing protocols as well as cleaning protocols um, in the school. The other thing we do is when we get either a positive or a presumptive positive um, in any of the cohorts or even a close exposure, we act on it immediately. We will quarantine a cohort to, to move away. We will quarantine um, an individual who's a, a presumptive positive as well as the cohort. And for close contacts, we move them out of the classroom back home to e-learning as quickly as we can. So those are our fundamental protocols. We also visit the schools regularly on a random basis because we survey them to say, how are the protocols doing? We look at the data and we survey them and, and visit to make sure that uh, the standard protocols we want followed are being implemented correctly. And in, we find very few schools where we have to intervene. Justin, are you all at all concerned that, you know, over Thanksgiving um, and then later on over the Christmas holiday, uh, that students might gather with extended families and possibly uh, create a spike in cases for the archdiocese? Well, I think that's, that's obviously on the plate there. I mean, all one has to do is to look at actually film on, on your newscasts as well as others of the airports um, and the numbers of people that are there. Also, the data out of Canada, which celebrates its Thanksgiving earlier than we do, uh, the Canadian government has published that they believe very strongly that at two weeks after their Thanksgiving in October, they experienced a significant bump in cases. So we can't ignore the fact that people are going to travel. We're seeing them traveling. And so we believe the judicious thing to do was to look again at the local context and see what we could do to head off that spike. Now, you all made the decision to allow schools to go remote uh, based on a survey of teachers and of your staff. Um, how did answers vary across the community? Because some communities are facing uh, different rates of coronavirus than others. That's, that's really a very good question. Um, across the board, by and large, we had a distribution of roughly 80% wanted to stay the course, irrespective of where they came from. We had 20% that did ask either to remove completely, uh, move now completely to virtual after the uh, Thanksgiving holiday, or to allow a hybrid back and forth. Now, I will say some of our schools, which have already had a higher percentage of the learners having pivoted, to e-learning already increased that percentage. So their responses often were higher in the range of let's move now. Um, so we saw that across different communities. And how will you decide what other changes you might need to make going forward with regard to remote versus in-person learning? Again, we're gonna monitor what's going on. We're looking at what, we, we're looking continuously at the factors of what are our families telling us? What's the general environment around the pandemic and what health experts are telling us, both the public departments of health and our private advisors. We're looking at what the workload is like and the uh, operational considerations within a school to keep it moving along. We're also looking um, as well as uh, the, the stress levels on the teachers and staff. So we continually review this data. We have with the task force and the senior leadership team, we have a call every day, four days a week, actually, out of the five. And uh, lots to of, lots of the situation. Yeah, sounds like lots of tough decisions for you all to make there. Justin Lombardo, thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Up next, surprising ways Ernest Hemingway appears in comics. But first, a look at the weather. In the comic book world, there's the Marvel Universe and the DC Universe, but less well known is the Ernest Hemingway Universe. The writer born in Oak Park in 1899 was a towering figure in 20th century literature, a witness to history, and remains a popular figure in comics. Over the years, comic book makers across the continents have found inspiration in Papa Hemingway. Producer Mark Vitale recently dove into this unexpected topic, Hemingway in comics. Here's another look. He has a biography in a Mexican comic book and a cameo with Topolino, the Italian Mickey Mouse. He even inspired a character in Superman. 
Ernest Hemingway often shows up in comics. A new book collects samples from around the world and explores the topic in earnest. Hemingway in comics is this sort of journey to all the weird, wonderful ways that Hemingway shows up in comics, which you wouldn't think would be a natural fit, but it is. So he's appeared in Superman, in Wolverine, Mickey Mouse comic books, sort of all over the spectrum and in reverent ways and sometimes in irreverent ways, but it sort of talks about what happens when you become a symbol and you lose control of what that symbol means. He's an avatar for whoever is writing about him and because he was in so many places, um, he's the perfect window to certain times in history. Hemingway and comic book creators have this kinship because on the comic book page and on Hemingway's pages, there's this need for an economy of words and for brevity and you know, the action takes place between the panels and Hemingway asks just from his style that you bring yourself and interpret it. When he's not writing books, Rob Elder works for the Bulletin of Atomic Scientists. He wrote and compiled this book not far from Ernest Hemingway's boyhood home in Oak Park. It includes adaptations of some famous Hemingway short stories, like this one from a Hungarian crossword puzzle magazine. It also includes some unexpected takes on this most macho of authors. Not only does it run sort of the gamut of comics and you get adventure stories and you get sort of deep philosophical stories, there's also some really interesting sort of modern stories about Hemingway's gender fluidity. And, you know, for people who don't know, you know, from, you know, the early part of his life, uh, he was raised as the twin, the female twin of his older sister. Peanuts, he shows up uh, and Snoopy is compared unfavorably to him as a writer. Italians in specific love Hemingway. He served in Italy uh, as a volunteer ambulance driver, so there's a great affinity for him. There's a book called The Hemingway Triathlon, and it's him uh, later in his life coming to terms with his own mortality, and the triathlon is uh, fighting, f***ing, and drinking. <laughs> the author spoke with luminaries in the world of comics, including Gary Trudeau of Doonesbury fame, and another Oak Parker, Chris Ware. It really is a deep dive. It is from an academic press, but we wanted to bridge pop culture with, uh, you know, sort of uh, well-researched academic theory and study. Uh, but mostly I just wanted to make it fun and accessible from a pop culture perspective. And I hope I succeeded. I think it's a lot of fun. For Chicago Tonight, this is Mark Vitale. And on our website, discover other writers and celebrities that are depicted in comic books in a short excerpt from the new book, Hemingway in Comics. And before we go, some WTTW news from this past weekend. WTTW's first-hand team won two Chicago Midwest Emmy Awards this weekend. So big congratulations to Dan Protest, Ann Gleason, Jessica Martinitis, and Pat Odom. Both first-hand coronavirus and first-hand gun violence took home the hardware. And congratulations to all of you for being recognized for this very important work. And that is our show for this Monday night. Please join us tomorrow night live at 7. And now we leave you tonight with some more video of that recent field trip uh, that the Shedd Aquarium penguins took to a familiar Chicago Can't get enough Chicago of those penguins. Landmark. I know, we, more penguins for everyone. Exactly. Now for all oh, of us here at Chicago Tonight, I'm Brandis Friedman. And I'm Paris. So they're about to take the field. Thank you so much for watching. <laughs> Stay healthy and safe. Good night. Closed captioning is made possible by Robert A. Clifford and Clifford Law Offices, representing dozens of families in the crash of a Boeing 737 MAX 8 jet. Mr. Clifford has been named lead counsel in litigation in federal court in Chicago.